camera's uh, straight and everything. A little bit to the right. <coughs> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وله Welcome everybody to Nothing But Facts live stream that is a continuation of last week's uh, stories of the awliya and we talked about the sayings of Nizamuddin awliya who is considered like one of the greatest shiuch of India in terms of the, mat, uh, the, the spiritual matters and we talked about last time, whenever Islam goes to a place, it goes with three things. Primarily, it, it, has, it goes with arms. It has to go with, with, with strength, with power, with um, an army. Secondly, it go, and these are the kings, the great kings and the great conquerors. Secondly, it goes with scholars. It goes with ulama that are um, uh, giving the hujjah uh, uh, against kufr, producing the hujjah against kufr. And also uh, providing the people with fiqh and aqidah and understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, that suits, that settles, satisfies the intellect, does not contradict it, and at the same time um, uh, bringing forth the knowledge of the Quran and fiqh and hadith, etc. And also the souls of the people have to be nourished with iman. And that's what Thursday is all about is these salihin and awliya who are essentially nourishing the souls of people with iman. So uh, that's just the topic that we're on and we have talked about Nizamuddin awliya part one and this is going to be part two and we may even have part three. So part, part two is going to be about his life. The beginning part up to the probably to one of the more uh, interesting things that happened in his life and he did have some amazing uh, things happen in his life and I'll tell you why uh, they say that if you, if you sincerely read the stories of the awliya every time you read one of them you're going to say this is my favorite one right and that's what you're going to read when you read the story of Nizamuddin awliya you're going to like you're going to want to be like him and I'm telling you we're, we're, we're going to be like him inshallah not as necessarily as an individual but what he did we're ve we have something very similar that we could possibly Allah can give us as a gift if we stay sincere and I'll, and you'll you'll understand what I'm saying, okay? <clears throat> when I read this, so walaikum salam to everybody who's on YouTube, Hamza, H Baz, Harris, Eslam, Muzammil, Sir Fraz, <clears throat> and on Instagram, Ofa, Magician, Magic Moment, Sarika, Amreen, Sanat. Maham. All right, let's start off with our uh, sponsors, and they are MeccaBooks.com. And by the way, MeccaBooks.com is going to be having um, a special sort of release on a book called Exemplars that you can get your hands on. And we're going to be, inshallah ta'ala, uh, be part of those interviews where they're going to be interviewing some of the authors who are writing about some of the shiuch that they met in the past. So that's going to be a nice book, inshallah ta'ala, that you'll be able to get your hands on. Next is up, professors1to1.com. If you need to study anything, if you need to um, uh, get tutoring, you go to professors1to1.com. After that, the summer term is coming, and we're going to have classes again, a whole long list of classes, at arcview.org. And that's where... Our online classes are what what we're trying to be is a moving dawah that has certain things to it and and boom classes they're all there arcview.org pre-recorded classes and live classes so and it's very affordable it's more affordable than any other institution that you can go to on site or online and then lastly patreon.com backslash safina society and that's how you can be part of this and i see you know, every once in a while, it pops up that somebody is, you know, supporting this podcast or this live stream that we're able to do and sit here four times a week, Monday through Thursday. Of course, there are vacation times that are off, but Monday through Thursday, we're here and just talking to people. Anybody who wants to talk and who wants to comment on YouTube. And that was really one of the things that Sayyidina Imam al-Haddad said uh, is, is wajib. 
that some people who are involved in knowledge have to do this and have to go out. And I, you know, always enjoy talking to strangers and talking to different people. So uh, with that, and then after a while, they don't become strangers anymore. We get to know them. And uh, sometimes they take classes, so we see them again in the class sessions. So with that, let's now turn to the life and times of Nizamuddin Awliya, starting from the beginning. All right, Nizamuddin Awliya was born an orphan. That's the first thing. Now, he was born pretty early in the time of Islam in India. Okay. And he was born in the, in terms of Islam in India, when it spread. So, of course, it was in Sindh, which is North India, pretty early on. But the spread took a long time. And his time in history is from 600 after the Hijra. Right, so he was born 636 after the Hijra, and he lived in that century. Across the, the rest of the 7th century, the 600s, into the 700s. Okay? So he was born uh, to, as an orphan. He did not have an older brother. He did not have anyone but his mom. And his mom was a very, very righteous and pious woman. And she raised him upon Iman from the get-go. And they were extremely, extremely poor. So how did he, she raised him on Iman. They were so poor that it was quite often that they had no food. There was no food for them to eat. It was very often that they didn't have any food. So she would say, let's make dua that uh, Allah give us something, send us a guest. All right? Allah, for Allah to send us a guest. And then, being that it was a small town and a little village and people were considerate that she is a widower or a widow a widower is when a man survives his wife but when a woman survives her husband she's a widow Armada. and uh, she has a child so people would come and they would give her food and this would be like new because it would be different food every time a different person would knock on the door and he would slowly he had become firm that Allah answers dua you see how, how important dua is? All right. It's so important that Allah answers dua that this concept and this idea. Why did this live video end on Insta? Oh, I thought it wasn't going, so I restarted. Oh, okay. No problem. No problem. Right. It should be good now. No? No, no, it's telling me here it ended. Yeah, it's still going. Yeah, it's still going. Yeah, it's still going. Yeah, it's still going. Live video ended? What? Weird. All right. Well, <clears throat> it says. Uh, that every time he would, so someone would answer and someone would answer the door, it would fill his heart, it would put down his heart that Allah answers dua. So you see the importance of dua in the life of a Muslim. I'm telling you, the issue of dua is as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called it al-ibadah, those who are too arrogant to worship me. So he said, and this is after saying, call upon me, I will answer you. So the importance of dua as being, literally, it is the, the, the soul of the deen and the crux of your iman is always related to dua. And if you look at the life of a regular person, their life, is, is their, their life of faith, it always grows around the moments in which they made dua. It's like a pillar. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ said, dua huwa mukhul ibad. It is the, the, the brain of ibad. Or in the, one, in the other... Uh, meaning of that, the the marrow, the bone marrow. Okay, so if this, so not not just the skeleton of your iman, but the bone marrow, which is what's inside the bones. All right, so that's so important. All right, the essence of how he was raised was upon dua for the most important things, food. Which what does that also mean? It means he was hungry all the time. Right? Uh, do we need to start? If we need to start the whole thing, just let me know. Is Instagram relevant? Instagram for me. Let me check again. Let me just close out and sort of check it all over again. Uh, yeah, now it's good. Yeah, all right, let's go. All right, so it's the, it's the crux of everything is that his stomach was always empty and that's, there's usually a lot of good things related to that. I mean, how many prophets went, were hungry? How many Sahaba early on, their training was hunger? But also, when he ate, it was always the result of dua. So, one time, they had some money, and they bought some corn. So now, like, they're doing things themselves. 
and they would eat corn every day until he got tired of corn and he told his mom, I like the old, the old ways where we never had anything and we would just make dua and the food would come. And he continued on this way until his mother advised him now to save up some money and she did it, she saved up some money and she took him as a teen to the shiuch. And what she did, she saved up some money, she bought a, a piece of cotton and she wrapped that, that strip of cotton around his head. Okay, so his first contact in life is a woman of so much iman and love of the symbols of religion and love of the deen and dua. Okay, she, she, there's no record that she was like a hadith scholar, hafiz of Quran, no. But she had a strong connection to Allah through dua. She puts a turban on his head and now you go and you start studying Arabic and you start studying fiqh. And that's where he goes. Okay, so he goes to Ala al-Din al-Usuli, and she, he starts studying Quduri, which is uh, Hanafi fiqh. Okay, and nonetheless, they were they they continued to live in extreme poverty. But there was a man who came, and he described a scholar named Baha al-Din Zakaria al-Multani, and he described the scholar that they, he had a monastery. Right, which is like a khanqa, whatever you want to call it. It's basically, it's a a waqf, it's an endowed place, and sometimes it's private property, these places. They could be either one. But it's not a public masjid in that it ought, does not offer Eid, Salah, does not offer Jum'ah in many cases, right, if it's too small. But it ha it, ha it offers the five prayers. There's a kitchen there. And the students live there, and the sheikh runs it from start to finish. And it could be private, closed, if they wanted to. You see, this, this, special, this institution has always existed in the Islamic world, where it's semi-public. It's not like a masjid that you can't deny people from coming to the masjid. right? And the masjid has to do certain things, such as offer tarawih, offer... Uh, certain prayers. You know, we, we, we mentioned Eid. Eid should actually always be in a garden outside or, or in the desert outside. But it's always offered in Masajid too in the absence of these um, uh, landscapes in the cities. So this is an institution different from the Masjid. Call, it's Khan, we're going to call it a Khanqa, a Ribat. In Yemen they call it Ribat. In the old days in, the Turks used to call it a Khanqa and the Persians used to call that, that word too. They used to have the word tekke. Sometimes they call it madras in the early times. Madras, a place of dirasa. But the sheikh rules it. The students live there. Some shiuch live there too. And the sheikh institutes his policies there. And he teaches the students. And oftentimes they have a kitchen there. The students eat from it and the poor eat from it. And this was the first time he heard of such a building, right? And such a place. And oftentimes the shiuch, they institute their awrad there. Their awrad meaning after, before Fajr you recite this. At Tahajjud everyone wakes up. At, after Fajr we read these adhkar. At Dhuhr we have these classes. The, he institutes his policies. Okay. And then there's a special time for guests to come in. This institution of these tekkes or khanikas or tek, whatever you want to call them, has existed in the Islamic world for centuries and it's been the source of so much goodness okay why because the masajid they became so huge and you can't no one has the right to just institute his policy on the masjid right the masjid is is a different institution now you may say and someone may say well hold on what did the prophet have did he have one of these or did he have a masjid no he had a masjid well there's a difference in the time of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam when things were not specialized and a time when things are. Let me give you another example. The Prophet ﷺ, nobody knew the Prophet from anybody else in terms of the clothes of the Messenger, peace be upon. And yet, when we fast forward, all of the Imams, there's like a code amongst the scholars of Imams, uh, scholars and Imams, that the scholar should have a certain type of garment in every culture that s signifies him. Like they, people know he's a scholar. Why? Why was that like a policy? And why was it illegal to wear the clothes of a scholar when you didn't have ijazah? Simple reason. 
Because if everyone went around wearing a big turban and a nice big uh, uh, garment that, that, that's known for scholars, the common people would ask fatwa from those who don't know. So it was in many <coughs> uh, cultures and in many uh, societies of Islam, not allowed to wear the clothes of a scholar. I remember reading in Fez, if you were a talib ilm, you could wear a turban up to four wraps, or if, any, if anybody could wear a turban, up to four wraps. The muftis only, those who had ijazah for fatwa, only could wear the eight wrap turban, eight wraps. And they should wear that, signifies it. If you go to the hospital, okay, the guy wearing a white lab coat and with uh, a stethoscope on his neck, if a man or woman are wearing that, that's the one that you know to ask medical advice from. If I went around a hospital wearing with my name here and a stethoscope and scrubs, okay, uh, that's illegal going around answering people's questions if i work if i wore an, uh, a police outfit and just walk up and down the street with a baton and and, and, a, and a police outfit is that allowed it's impersonating an officer right it's a crime because we know we can go to the officers for help they can help us they have the legal right to help us so scholars then so when society became segmented we have a standing army it's not just any old farmer goes in defense. We have police. We have doctors. Society became segmented and specialized. Then every profession should have its own garment. So that's just a sign that in the time of the prophet, certain things are certain ways because of how simple their society was. But as things progressed, different buildings for different purposes. So when he heard about Zakaria al-Multani, they said that the Sheikh was so godly, Rabbani, godly meaning Rabbani, it's a, we're allowed to use that word, meaning that he is so close to Allah Ta'ala that he's created such an environment where the atmosphere of sanctity, enthusiasm for studying, enthusiasm for eagerness for ibadah, so much so that the servants, the servants who were just there to work, were, their tongues never stopped in the remembrance of Allah. And when they had spare time, they were remembering Allah. Okay? So he, cre he created this environment. Now, you can't do this in a place if there's an inflow of that for those forces which would decrease your himma, right? If there's a constant incoming flow of certain forces that would decrease your himma, right? And decrease your enthusiasm, you can't create that enthusiasm. And that enthusiasm, it, it builds like a headquarters and it spreads out to the rest of the city. Okay? So this was the first time that Sheikh Nizam al-Din Awliya had ever heard of such a building, of such a place. That you would go and... So what's, what's an example? In, in, in local life, you, you come across all sorts of people who have no interest in the deen. They decrease your himma. Himma is your energy and your enthusiasm. All right? And so you need a certain place where that doesn't happen, okay? where the enthusiasm is constantly being stoked like a fire. And everyone's supporting everyone else in this. So that's, now when he heard about it, <clears throat> he was moved. But then the guests, he said, I went from the uh, Khaniqa of Baha'uddin Zakaria al Multani. I went then to Sheikh al Islam Khawaja Fariduddin. And they call him Sultan al Awliya. He's the king of Awliya. And then he went and then and he started speaking about the Khanaka of Fariduddin. And he said, That's who my heart became inclined towards. And so I started to love Fariduddin. In the back of his mind, he said, I love Fariduddin. Okay, Khawaja Fariduddin. But he never met him yet. Now time passed and he spent three and four years studying in the busy city of Delhi. And Delhi was the capital city of Islam in India at that time. He goes there to the big city and he's a student. And what does he get known for? He gets known for being a great debater. Okay? He, be he, he, he becomes called the killer of gatherings. Why was he the killer of gatherings? Because whenever people would gather and debate, he had such a profound expertise on logic, mantiq, and language that he would destroy everyone in a debate. So in the world of, de of these cities, 
and, and that's what these cities are like. You sit around, you talk, right, and you have these debates, and cities gather all sorts of people. Unlike, let's say, a farmland or a suburb, nobody goes there, right? So uh, traditions develop in these places, and no one questions these traditions. But the city, it always attracts all sorts of people. And it brings new ideas. So ideas are always clashing in the cities. Like when I, uh, when I lived in London, every kind of idea is in London. And then you go out and visit a friend, let's say, in Blackburn. And there's a neighborhood in Blackburn. That neighborhood, people don't usually go there, right? It's not like no one's traveling to go live in Blackburn. So traditions settle. And local imams, local leaders establish certain norms. And the connection between people is a family connection. So you don't want disruption. And so you find traditions are established. Customs and traditions, good, bad, or otherwise. But it's customs and traditions are established in, in those cities, in those off, uh, further away uh, towns and villages. But in the cities, it gathers all sorts of people. Just like here, New York, right? I remember there was an imam. And this imam is open to all sorts of nonsense. So, so much surprised, I don't even talk to him. He came to our parts, and he was so surprised that we have, like, we have traditions here. We all believe the same things, right? And we're doing the same thing. And he was, like, a little bit shocked. He's, like, out of his place. I was like, yeah, we're not like you guys in Manhattan uh, with uh, every single type of uh, idea, and you guys have to tolerate that. We don't. We, have, we know what's true. We believe what's true. And this is what the message is based upon. And if you don't like it, tough. Simple as that. Go somewhere else. Right? There, are, there has to be at some point like a line being drawn. Otherwise, you go crazy. And also, cities are not places where families... Some of these city mosques are not places where families are raised. So you could be open to new ideas. You're all youth. You're all adults. But once you have a place where people are raising their kids upon this message, there needs to be trustworthiness and predictability. I'm dropping off my kids to you guys. To summer camp when they're... To, to high school events. Tomorrow we have a tweens event for middle schoolers only at the park, right? Uh, people are going to drop their, their sixth graders, seventh graders off. There needs to be predictability. They need to know exactly what's being taught and don't shake the, don't rock the boat, okay? Because otherwise I can't trust you. So, so he's now in the city and he's witnessing all this and he becomes a great debater. So much so that he becomes famous uh, uh, for that. And he starts memorizing poetry and literature. And he memorizes these books so much so that later on, uh, it's just like, a, like a, the arts, right? Later on, he makes Toba from that. And he says, I wash out my brain from all that uh, uh, nonsense by memorizing hadith later on in his life. Right? So he had memorized parts of Maqamat al-Hariri, which is how to do poetry and how to the different maqams and the uh, different rhymes of poetry and these types of things. So it's basically like going to New York and being in the art crowd, right? And then realizing after some period of time that you just wasted all your time, right? Now, Nizamuddin at this point, he's with his friends. They're all people studying fiqh. They're studying the deen. Right? But something inside of him is not right. Something inside of him is really upset. He's, he's not settled. And although he says, all my friends were righteous, we were pious, studying the deen, and moving on with careers. You studied back in the day, and then you took a career on somewhere with the state. Right? So you were a qadi. You could move into administration. Right and stu see, studying back then, it was not seg knowledge was not like segmented like in today's world where you study the dean and you wonder, well, what am I going to do in society? No, when you studied back then, you studied language, you studied multiple languages. By the way, India especially, they studied Persian. You studied other languages. You studied logic. Okay, learn how to use your intellect. You studied the Quran, and you studied Hanafi law. That was the law of the country too, right? So when you imagine studying fiqh, that is law school, essentially. All right? So you're, the Islamic study, the, the sh sharia study, is the study of the, of, of the place. 
when you studied mathematics, there was not an idea that, okay, now we're studying Dean, now we're studying math. No, it was all mixed as one. Okay, so these jamias, these places of studies, they, they, they were places of uh, the secular and the sacred. Now, the next step now is that you're going to get a job. So the motive of these students is pious, but also it's very realistically in the world. Right? And he, at the same time, he said, something inside of me, I just wanted to be alone. He, a, a phase reached him, and he said here, uh, I would remain, uh, I felt agitated. I would feel agitated. And I told my friends that I would not remain with them for a long time, and I would go away. So something inside of his heart was not settled yet. Okay? And you could imagine that we're going to have Islamic colleges, what justifies an Islamic college? Wouldn't the, just, the main justification for an Islamic college be the idea that you can get a great job from this, right? The moment you say that, aren't you at that point setting up a worldly purpose and intention, right? So it, as halal as it can be, not only halal, righteous. And don't you see that when, when people say, oh, you're going to make an Islamic college, oh, are you... Uh, is, are you accredited? They asked that question. Oh, yes, we're accredited. Oh, yeah, well, what, who, what's your students like? So-and-so, student so-and-so graduated and now is going to medical school. So-and-so is graduated and now go to law school. Graduated so-and-so and going to Islamic studies PhD somewhere else. All that is halal and good. But it is nonetheless something of the world where students are, are, are taking this and now the motive, it seems... The framing of the whole thing is you go there for, to get, as a stepping stone to your occupation. And that's the school that he was in. Okay? And that's the environment that he was in. So now they're all graduated and they're all getting different jobs. And now he's hovering in his 20s. He's in, like, in his early 20s. All right? But he's agitated. He's not happy. Something inside of him is empty. So one day he goes over to his mom and every new moon was a time that the students would visit their parents. That was the time off. So he would always visit his mother, and his mother was so pious, she was one of really almost, maybe she was one of the awliya, she said to him, uh, next new moon, who are you going to visit? So he took that and realized that my mother's going to die. And he became upset that night. Next morning, he says, well, who's going to be my guardian after this? Okay. Who, who's, who's going to, who do I have after, who do I have beyond this? This is the only person he has in his life. He said, tomorrow I tell you. Next day, he's still visiting his mom uh, outside of Delhi. And his mother calls him. And she holds his hand. And she says, she puts up his, her hands up in dua. Okay. While holding his hand. And she said, Oh Allah, I entrust this young man, son of mine, to your care. So again, it's Iman. Completely trusting on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said that, I was so happy with that. And uh, so contented. And he said, I, I didn't expect that. It's not, that's not what you expect. But she passed away shortly thereafter. Now he's completely empty. Like he has nobody in his life. All right? And they start applying, and all of his friends start getting jobs. And he says to his teacher, I want to apply to be a Qadi. Now, who's his teacher? His teacher is the cousin of Fariduddin. Khawaja. They used to say Khawaja as like Sayyid, Sir, Mr., whatever. Fariduddin. And uh, his name was Najibuddin Mutawakkil. All right? And he was his uh, uh, brother, sorry, Fariduddin's brother. And he said, help me get a job as a Qadi. And as any young man, no, as pious as he is, he wants what his others uh, are getting. A, job, a post here in the administration, a post there. So he's like, I want to be Qadi, judge. So the sheikh stayed silent. And he's pushing him. He said, come on, help me get a job. Talk to your friends. Finally... His teacher, he shook his head. He said, you shouldn't be a judge. 
what I advise you to do is go to my brother. And he and Ajodhan, it's a city, a quiet city, Ajodhan. And he starts remembering, yes, I love Fariruddin. I've always wanted to be Ed, but he never connected the two, that this is, that my disquietude, my empty feeling, that that's what's going to be the solution. So he accepts this, and he goes, and he starts to sit at the gatherings of Fariruddin. And he noticed Fariruddin, okay, every time... Uh, he would start sitting in his gatherings. Every time the students would be late or something, or they wouldn't come, Fariduddin says, are you okay? Are the classes okay? Is it my fault that, did I do something wrong in the classes? So he was almost like, like differential to the students. But Nizamuddin, he never missed classes, and he would always keep him next to him, right? He would always keep him next to him. And slowly Nizamuddin started to rise in his eyes. He started to serve him. He started to be a great example for him, right? Uh, for the other students. Every time new students would come, he would show them the way, right? So he started to, to, to excel in the followership of Fariduddin. He would do the prayers. He lived there, okay? He would do the ibadat that they all did together. So Fariduddin made him a room. He made him a special room, okay? And he treated him very well. Now Nizamuddin, he said... He said to the sheikh, he said, I want now to terminate my studies. I want to do awrad and dhikr all day and all night. And Fariduddin realized that he had such a dhuq, he had such a, a, a love of dhikr, that, that even the sharia studies to him became a hardship. He just wanted to be immersed in the dhikr of Allah all day and all night. And he said, and Sheikh Fariduddin said to him, a mendicant, an Abid can never be free of classes. He must be studying. But seeing that you basically are having such a hard time doing anything except remembering Allah, I will teach you myself. So he sits and he teaches him the classes himself. And he finishes the curriculum. He said there were some books and some hifz of Quran that I hadn't done and some books of uh, uh, zuhud that I haven't studied. So they studied awarif al-ma'arif. They studied other books and he started teaching him Quran, memorizing Quran with him. And he said, you have to do both. You must be, you do dhikr and you must study the sharia. And so he taught him himself until he almost finished. Now, at some point, it was very clear that, it was very clear that Nizamuddin was the selected student of Fariduddin. It had become clear. He's giving him private lessons, everything. Now one day, they were studying Awarif al-Ma'arif. Spoken to Sawf. It's Zuhud, etc. And every day that Fariruddin would read, the book was so old and it was written in bad handwriting. It was written by a scribe who was old. So the handwriting was, was old, bad, because the man was old, he was maybe shaky. The paper was coming apart in the book. Nizamuddin innocently says, Oh, by the way, your brother, Najibuddin, he has a better copy. I can go get that. Suddenly, Fariduddin looks up at him, okay, stands up at him, and he says, what happened to your manners? Out, now! Samadhin so, is what? He was shocked. Said, What's wrong with that statement? He said, I just, he's thinking to himself, your brother has another one, I could go get that. All of a sudden, Fariruddin completely transformed. Expelled him. What? I'm expelled? I'm expelled? For, for what? All of a sudden, he doesn't know what's happening. His mind is spinning. His head is spinning. Okay? So, he leaves. And he comes back, weeping. He says, Sheik, explain to me what I did wrong. I'm wrong. I'm guilty. But explain to me. And I, I, and, and I seek forgiveness. Out. He then went and he spent two days expelled outside of the Hanukkah, out in the woods, right? Coming back, trying to come back and apologize, right? And, and seek forgiveness. 
And then he was given an audience with she with the sheikh. Okay. And he said, I am 100% guilty. I apologize. He not once asked the question of what did I actually do wrong? He just accepted it. I'm 100% wrong. I'm 100% guilty. And that's in front of everybody. Saw that. Immediately, Fariduddin, a big smile came upon him. And he said, that was your final test of whether or not you're going to lean on your ego and this is my right and I didn't do anything wrong. This was your final test and here you are, you are, he has written a letter. You are my, officially my representative now because maybe he saw that his time is up and he needs a representative and you are now fully yeah, and you, your, your nefs is completely erased. You have no ego anymore. Now this person, he has no, and he has full trust. Because here you have a moment. Do I trust? By the way, the sheikh, he's free to expel who he wants from his building, right? There's nothing of the sacred law that was broken here. It's his building, right? It's his school. It's his time. He could expel whom he wants. And he expelled him, Right? Like in New Jersey, it's an at-will agreement, at-will state. We're an at-will state in New Jersey. Anyone who has a job, it's at with the will of the owner. He does not have to honor, he has, let's say it's a two-year contract. At any time, both employer and employee, they could say, khalas, we're done with. But there have to be terms of breaking the, 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 the relationship. Okay? So, he didn't do anything wrong on the Sharia. He trusted and he put himself down. Okay? And he just came with an apology. So, Sheikh the Fariduddin said, "All right, this was all for you to, to 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 your final test against your ego, and now you're going to be my representative, and you are done here. You're done being here. You're going to go to Delhi. You're going to go back to that city. Okay." And, and you're going to be a da'ya. You're going to do da'wah in that city, in the city of Delhi. So he spent a few more days, and at, at that time, one of his old classmates came. And his old classmate came now in the suit of a sheikh, of a, of a judge, of an administrator, whatever he was, with wealth, salary now. You ever have somebody who became a zahid in college? And his other student went to medical school, right? When they meet up after like five, six years, the one who's in medical school or engineering or whatever, he comes in a nice car, he's got clothes, and the Zahid is like beat up. He's completely in Zuhud. And he looks at him and he said, what, in the, what is this? What happened to you? He's like, I follow Fariduddin now. He said, well, you could have had a great job. He said, yeah, but if you taste what we have here, then it was lunchtime. Fariduddin went and he came back, uh, Nizamuddin went and he came back with the lunch tray on his head. And he was wearing like simple like rags basically, like regular clothes, poor people clothes, poor clothes. And he said, what is this? You carrying the food on your head like this? Let me take it. He said, no, no, no. This is how we do things. And he was very impressed on the humility that Fariduddin instills in his students. He put it down, and then after they ate, Nizamuddin would not allow any of the, the students, his old classmates, to clean up. He cleaned it up himself, and he carried it on his head. They, he became so impressed. His, his, his friend became so impressed, he became a disciple too of Fariduddin al -Attar. So this is a humility, and it's a side of Islam that they excelled at. That's why they're called Zuhad. They excelled at this. Now Nizamuddin... Uh, 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 is the last day that he's spending with Fariduddin and he's about to go to Delhi to start his dawah. Now, he's not well known. Nobody knows him. He's a young man. He's in his late 20s now. And Fariduddin puts his hands up and he says, Oh Allah, bestow him with the strength okay, to become the Sultan of Delhi, uh, of Hindustan. The Sultan of Hindustan. Now he does not mean the physical sultan of Hindustan, but the spiritual sultan of Bilad al-Hind. And then he says, after a pause, and he said, and give him a slice of this world as well, that he will need to fulfill his mission. And then Sultan 
uh, that Nizamuddin, he became upset with that. He's like, Sheikh, I live here, we live so simply, right? In this little town, we live with nothing. We have no burdens of dunya. I'm worried now about this dua, this last part of the dua. Give him a slice of the dunya. He said, you're going to need it, but it won't affect you. And as we're going to see, Nizamuddin's his Hanukkah, his monastery, is more like a royal court than it is a little simple poor Hanukkah or Tekke of the uh, of the uh, of his his sheikh. He goes to Delhi, and he has a hard time in Delhi. Of course, nobody knows him. There's no place for him to preach. He's preaching wherever he could to, to whomever he could, but he goes on day after day after day, extremely poor. And he had no place to live. The prices are so high in Delhi. Remember, the Mongols have come, disrupted the entire Persian cities, all the, the area, and all those Persians, all those elites, they've come together. And where do they come? They come to Delhi. So Delhi, it's an expensive place. It's like Abdul Qadir al-Jailani. Ahmed, assalamu alaikum. So Abdul Qadir al-Jailani went uh, to Baghdad, and he said... He went from this small village where he lived, again, with his mom, an orphan, went to the big city to study, and it was so expensive. And he has a famous line of poetry. Baghdadu madinatun mushriqatun. Tadiqu fiha nafaqa. Baghdad is a, a luminous city. But your, your monthly expenses are going to be so tight. Qarunu law halla biha jaza lahu sadaqa. If Qarun lived in it, he can accept zakah. And you know Qarun is the richest man of Bani Israel, so much so that his, the keys of all his treasures and his, his, his chests of, of, of gold, they had to be carried by multiple people. So it's a funny poem where he says, if Qarun lived in Baghdad at this time, he kicks up. It's like San Francisco today. If you live out in California, uh, $7 a gallon for gas. You go to Target for your family, $500, right? Just supplies, that's it. You're not buying anything special. So it's expensive. Delhi is extremely expensive. He, is, he does not like living in Delhi at all. He, he hates the city. And he just doesn't see Zuhad there. There's no, there's no people doing ibadah. He finally one day sees in a mosque a man doing ibadah. He's a Turk. And he says, did you, you are a citizen of Delhi? And the man looks at him and says, by force, not by choice. <laughs> right? Because it's, imagine lower Manhattan, trying to be a Zahid in lower Manhattan. Lower Manhattan is where people are chasing their salaries, people are chasing their money, right? There's no zuhud there, right? So it's not a place, he's so out of place. But he tries to preach, he tries to talk to people. He has no place to preach even. Until he finally starts making dua, I want to leave, I want to leave, I want to leave. Okay? And then, at some point, someone gives him a, an advice and says... Why don't you go to... He, a stranger, a complete stranger, comes and says, just go to the suburb right outside of Delhi. So the people of Delhi could reach you, but you'll be in a more quiet place with more pious people. Okay? And this is a city called Ghiathpur. I don't know if it still exists. Maybe, Ahmed, you could check on your phone if Ghiathpur, what it is today. But it's like... It's right outside of Delhi. Okay? Where people from Delhi could come to you, all right. But I mean, Riyadhpur, it did have, um, you know, proximity enough to Delhi. And so, this 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 stranger came up to him and said this to him, and then Khawaja Nizamuddin brought him lunch, and the man keeps talking about how why, how good it is to go to Riyadhpur, and he says, "You've been a great help. Why don't you come and eat eat with me here?" And he said, uh, I won't eat until you promise that you're going to go to Riyathpur. So Nizamuddin knew at that point that this is not some straight, random stranger. This must be a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that that's the city I'm going to go to. When he finally goes to Riyathpur from Delhi, that's where he finds his success. And he really starts his dawah to pick up, right? Where it's a nicer place to live. It's not as loud, Okay. And there, all of a sudden, things start to change for him. In the dua of Fariduddin, that some of this dunya, you get a slice of the dunya as well, it starts to come true. 
that the people of Riyathpur, it's not that popular. Ahmed, you got an answer for us? No? The, uh, maybe someone here knows where Riyathpur is. I don't know. Maham, aren't you from India? Yeah. Alright, so Riyathpur is not a place that's so that's where it's a rat race of dunya. It doesn't have that many shiuch in it, so he stands out. And he starts preaching to the people. And a very rich man notices him. And he says, I have a building for you. Take this building. And he gives him a gorgeous building. Okay? So big, you didn't know what to do with it. Massive hall and rooms all around it. Okay? And then another person listening to, listen, who listens to his speech. Now he has a place to, speech, right? uh, to, to speak. He has a place to, stu- to, to, to preach out of and to hold prayer sessions. And there someone says, you know what, let me fix up. Let, let me fix up uh, uh, this, this room for you. And all of a sudden, within a short span of time, this, the, the sitting place, the preaching center of Nizamuddin Awliya looks like a royal court. And the rich come, and they're at awe at the place. But Nizamuddin, he never changes in his indifference to the dunya. And a habit develops, which is the habit until the rest of his life. Nobody comes to Nizamuddin empty-handed. They come in with gifts. And then Nizamuddin doesn't know what to do with these gifts. Yeah. All right. Aniqua says, Riyathpur is actually New Delhi, what's called today New Delhi. So as as I said, it's right outside of Delhi, right? So he went to Delhi, he hates it, but he ends up going right outside Delhi. So all the people of Delhi come to him. Okay? But they have to travel a little bit. So, the people come with the best gifts possible, and his building, his place, becomes a place filled with stuff. So whenever the poor people come, they take all these gifts. They take all these wonderful gifts. People come and they bring him food. He has it cooked. So much so that his place was imagined almost like a an, an, an beautiful restaurant. And that's what sort of something gave me an idea. People have these soup kitchens, right? You ever go to these, uh, any soup kitchen in a city? You feel like you're in a, a high school, uh, uh, an elementary school cafeteria? A middle school cafeteria? You feel like you're in a jail? It is a dump. It's a place you wouldn't even want to stay there for two minutes. Why? If... When we do our renovations downstairs, inshallah, this is the example we're going to follow. Because his place was a place the elite would want to come. And food was free. The kitchen was going every single day and the food was all free for the people. But the, it was so refined. Everything about it, the floor, the walls, the lighting, the food itself was so refined that the, the rich would, would have joy to come and eat with him. And they would love to come and eat with him because it was clean. The food was good. The place was nice, furnished. And he would sit and barely, he would pretend to eat. He would barely have a piece of bread, some vegetables. He would not indulge in much of what was there, but he'd left it so that the elite could feel that they could go there. If if it was a place that was a poverty and it was miserable, then is that a good dawah? The elite would feel uncomfortable, Right? The rich, even the middle class, would feel like, I'm not really comfortable here, I want to leave. Like, we don't like this place. So he made it, so it was, it happened to be that these rich people came in and they furnished it for him, they made everything nice for him. So the rich and the elite and the poor, everyone from the top of society to the bottom of society, wanted to be there and felt comfortable there. And the, of course the poor, wow, this is like, we don't go to the royal courts, but we go to Nizamid Deeds. <laughs> Like, we don't know what, what wealth means. We've never seen the rich people's, these fancy restaurants. We don't go there, but we can come here. And that's the idea that we have. When we expand this place, the way it should be should not be like mass seating for everyone, junk and trash. So it's, it should be like a nice place, right? Where some people could come in and they could sit nicely and eat nicely. Just because people are poor doesn't mean they're treated like trash. And by the way, there's... There's a famous um, uh, uh, chef. He's famous on Netflix. They gave him a show. 
for or like a documentary. Now, what this guy did, he's one of the best chefs in Europe because they have the Michelin stars, right? This guy's got like three Michelin stars. Now, what is he's an Italian and he married an American and he has an amazing restaurant in Italy. Okay, this guy is a really fun guy. He's so successful. He said, I don't know what to do now. He says, you and you get so successful, you don't know what to do. He came up with an idea. He said, why is it that all the restaurants for the poor are junk? He said, why don't we make a foundation? It's a nonprofit. You could donate to it. And he with his own money too. Where it's a really smart idea. He said, young artists and young chefs can come in. And I'll train them and how to cook the food of the of of you know great restaurant food and we'll try out new recipes and the poor will eat for free you know like how they train you to get haircuts where do they, who do they train on right like you there are places you can go and get a two dollar haircut but it's a real guy training a kid and you're the experiment right they experiment on your head you're only paying two dollars anyway right so he, it's a training spot for new chefs artists to design the, these restaurants and then he gets what they call the um, misfit foods you know what a misfit is in the realm of food okay a misfit is like a pepper that doesn't that has a hole in it a carrot that's like crooked like something you wouldn't serve to the to in a, in a supermarket it's like a little beaten up he gets all the misfit foods so it's cheap it's, it's free there's no budget here it's all charity so he gets that food, and that's what they, they cook on. And they make these amazing recipes, right? And it's a wonderful restaurant, and the poor come in, and they sit uh, uh, at a restaurant. Not at a lunch table like a bunch of bums, right? Like where their poverty is in their face. No, they sit at a restaurant, and they order from a menu, okay? And a waiter goes, and he gets the order. And these, these trained kids... So it's not like a restaurant that New York Times is going to sit and write a review, right? So there's no threat. And there's no concern about like, you know, like, oh, the soup was this, that, or the other. But at the same time, it's great food. It's creative food. And you know these people, they, you know, we don't really do that. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi didn't encourage that, by the way, just to give you an idea. Oh, let's make uh, a 10-step pasta. No, the Prophet didn't like this stuff. And, but right uh some of it is within the halal but the prophet in general he never liked that food be over the top extravagant right but anyway that's how these europeans do these food. these chefs like do you want to take a pasta he'll find a way to make it a 10-step pasta right we don't do this but this is what they do there so it gave me the idea and someone here saying is that um i think someone just said here that uh the it was it was called subhanallah Allah had given him a share of jannah it was like jannah on earth the derga derga or the place where he's buried right it's like heaven on earth so but they played, made this place a place where the elite and the poor would all come now he lived over the span and he ruled or or, or he 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 managed this uh this this derga or this khanaka and over the years, he became a little bit more and more famous to the point that he lived across the span of six sultans. And the sultanate was run out of New Delhi. Now, the first one didn't know who he was, lived and died. He was still up and coming. The second one didn't know who he was. The third one, the third, the third sultan that he lived in his lifetime, he knew who he was. And he had become somebody that in the back of like side conversations, he's a righteous man. You go to him. You spend time in his derga. Okay? And you visit him. Okay? And he never leaves. He does not visit the kings, the sultans, and he does not allow sultans and kings to visit him. But in the beginning, they didn't even know about him. But finally, they came to know about him. Okay? And, one, and, for the, and the third king at that time had a high respect for him and loved him and used to say, go ask him du'a. Ask him for his du'a and send him our salams. 
like so he he just got on the radar where the king wouldn't go there of course right is where the sultan goes is a big deal he wouldn't go there but he heard about him i'll ask him for our dua next king same thing until it became common that if you're anyone of worth you need to get his dua it became a thing right and in the same way, and not to make an example of a Muslim and a non-Muslim, but there is a preacher, there's an American preacher, he's a Protestant preacher, who has taken a different um, avenue to preaching. And he says, and his way of preaching, his avenue towards preaching, is the idea that don't the, the rich and famous need uh, preachers too, right? There's the wolf and the sheep. But the wolf needs a preacher too. So it's a special group. They live right outside of Washington, D.C., in Virginia. They have a big uh, home in a suburban area where they run their operation out of. And this guy took it as his job to preach to politicians. That's it. All he preaches to is to politicians. And the way he would do this is that every Sunday morning, the entire organization, very rich organization, entire organization is dedicated to Sunday breakfasts. And the job of everyone in, or, in the organization is, in, throughout the week, cozy up to politicians and get them invited to this breakfast. No, it's not Sunday. Sorry, it's Tuesday morning. It's a, like average day, no, nothing's going on. Tuesday morning breakfast. At, to get a, politicians to come. They started with one politician, two. Low level. Finally, congressmen. Senators. Until it became a thing. He does this every single Tuesday morning. They would have this breakfast. And then they have one annual event every year, which many people think is a government thing. It's not. The National Prayer Breakfast has such a vanilla name. National Prayer Breakfast, it's, it was one Sunday a year where there was a huge breakfast and speeches were given and prayers for the nation, right, by all their supporters. I think, I don't know who it was, but one president showed up one time. They got the president of the United States to show up. Trump was there. Huh? Oh, yeah, he, he went there. Yeah. And they got uh, C-SPAN to cover this event. And then every year now, it became like a sunnah for them that the president has to go there. If you're the president, you have to go to the National Prayer Breakfast. So much so that people like us, we think that this is a government event. It's not, right? It's run by this one preacher. I think he died and now it's, this, it's on the next generation. But it's the idea that once one president came, Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower was the first one to go. Okay. Once one president came, it became like a, dynamo, uh, uh, a domino effect. Every president has to go. So it became to the point that if you're a sultan, if you're a governor, if you're in any position of authority, you have to have some nice symbolic relationship with Khawaja Nizamuddin. But there was one rule. He never visits you, you never visit him. All right? That was the rule. And one of them, Alaeddin al Khilji, or did I get the name right? Jalal al Din al Khilji. He was the first one. And he loved him so much. He said, I have to visit him. He said, He doesn't accept kings to visit him. If you're a governor, you're a king. You can't visit. You can send your letters. We'll make dua for you. That's it. So no, no shubha. Shubha meaning like, like uh, uh, an ability for people to accuse you of, of being in bed with politicians. Right? You want to send him gifts, send him gifts. And he's going to give it away to the poor anyway. Right? So this sheikh, Jalal al-Din khilji he loved him so much that he said, I'm going to actually dress up and surprise him. But he needed somebody to take him. So Amir Khusro is a famous poet. He was a disciple of Nizamuddin Awliya. And he told Amir Khusro, Amir Khusro is like one of these, you know, every sheikh, he's got a guy, he's got a disciple who does his political work, right? This is something Allah creates. I heard a funny statement saying, you don't become a sheikh until you have three types. You have a, sh uh, a jurist, someone who, who knows the inside outs of fiqh and is all respected with the fuqaha, who has the time and the energy to go into the depths of fiqh or kalam or whatever, and he's your disciple. 
And then you have uh, someone who goes and does and has an interest in politics and he goes with the politicians and he, he, makes, he has the link with the politicians. But you don't do it yourself. And the third one then is a fool who, takes, who, who, who disciplines everybody. Like a fool. This is so funny because you don't become a sheikh until you have a fool. right? A fool is in your circle who says what the sheikh wants to say but is too polite to say. Right? And it's almost like a henchman. Or doesn't, doesn't every king have a, a court jester? Right? He is someone who physically will take care of people for you. Right? And he will say what the sheikh can't say because he's too polite to say it. It's a funny saying. It's just a saying, right? That the, you don't become a real sheikh until you have these three around you. Right? And maybe they said a fourth thing. Who knows? But he ends up that Amir Khosro is his man who goes to the politicians and he mingles with them. So he's friends with the, uh, the Sultan, Jalal al-Din Khilji. And Jalal al-Din Khilji makes the mistake of telling Amir Khusro, I'm going to dress up and I'm going to go and surprise the Sheikh because I have to meet him. I love him so much. So Amir Khusro, the night, night before, he goes to Nizamuddin and he says, by the way, tomorrow the Sultan is coming. He loves you so much he's coming. He said, okay. Next morning, he goes and he visits uh, another sheikh. He goes and he visits his sheikh, the, the, the grave of his sheikh. So that when uh, the sultan came, when the king arrived, the sheikh wasn't there. So then he took him to task, the king. He said to Emir Khusru, why, why did you betray my trust? He said, it's either that, it's either I upset you, and I calculated, maximum that you could do is kill me. Or, I betray the sheikh, I know he doesn't want to see kings, and if I betray the sheikh, he may make dua against me, and then my akhirah is in trouble. So I had to weigh the harms, and I near lesser harm. So, of course, the sultan laughed, and he said, the sheikh is disciplined. The sheikh will not see a king. Now, the next son, uh, the cousin of the sheikh, uh, of the, the sultan, becomes the ruler, and he has no relationship with the sheikh. He doesn't care, right? He's just a sheikh. He has no, he not for or against. So people start to whisper, and this is what happens. Hold on a second. Nizamati, he's getting too big. Every rich person has to come and visit him, right? Every sultan comes and has to love him. And they start whispering that he might be a threat. He's a political threat, okay? And so he writes a letter to test him. And he sends it with a man by the name of Khizr Khan. And he sends it to him. And this letter in it, it says basically something to the uh, effect of, you know, we need a sign of your loyalty. We need to know which side you're on. Now once this letter came in, it's as if Nizamuddin knew exactly what this was. That his, his fame and his power and, and his attraction of the people is so high that uh, the, the new king is worried. So he said, before you even open the, the, the letter, I know what's in it. And he said, tell the king, I'll never threaten his kingdom with an army. And we are making du'a for him and all Muslim kings and all Muslim people. Okay, And I'm going to sit in my corner and make du'a for him and the Muslims and he could go in his palace and rule the land and not have any, I don't have any business with him. He doesn't have any business with me. And then the, the emissary says, says to him, uh, says, that's a good answer. And he goes back and he says, you don't have to worry about him. But then the relationship got better. That there was a big threat. And there, was an, there's, there are always wars back in those days. On the edges. Not an inside, but on the edges. And he sent a letter. And he said, uh, well, there's a big war coming up. Big battle coming up. And we need your du'a. And Nizamuddin says, he reply, his reply was, this king has had many victories, but this victory will be, there, but those past victories will pale in comparison to the next victory that he's going to have. So he was filled with confidence and they went in and he would always send him news from the troops. 
this is what our troops are doing, blah, 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 blah. Give us instruction, give us dua, give us dhikr. And he would do that. Okay. And that was the relationship. Until after that, Ala din al Khilji, that was Ala din al Khilji. His second son came to the throne and cut off, he came to the throne illegally. Khizr Khan was supposed to be the next king. That same emissary, he was supposed to be the next king. He cut him off. And he became the next king. But he was a fool. His name is Qutb al-Din. Right? Qutb al-Din was a fool. And that's what happens. That's why you have to run a country or a company. It has to be run. It has to be simple. Because one day it will be run by an idiot. Okay? And Qutb al-Din was a fool. Rather than just he it got in his mind I can't trust Nizamuddin everyone loves him and they don't love me okay so he says from now on all of these shiuch they have to come to my court on the first of the month every new month when there's a, when the new moon is sighted I expect you to all be at my court at Maghrib on the next day first of the month right because the month the new moon is sighted next Maghrib you're in my court Right, and we'll have sessions, whatever. But it will be a symbol that you're, I'm, I'm, I'm in control here. So this guy is a fool, okay. And so Nizamuddin refuses to go. What he does is he sends an emissary. He sends one of the tulab al ilm. He sends one of the young shiu. You go instead. I'm not going. First month, second month, third month. Qutb al Din. He's like, this is an insult. You're sending me. An assistant? You come your message out next month. Nizamuddin comes alive or dead. If he doesn't come alive, he's gonna come dead. That means if he doesn't come, all right, physically himself, we're gonna kill him. And this becomes a huge scandal and huge news, and day after day, and they ask. And people start talking to Nizamuddin. Just go. Save your madrasa. Save your life. It's halal for you to go now. And day passes after day, after day, after day. And this crazy king and this fool, he starts sending spies to see, is he coming or not? This idiot is picking a fight that he doesn't have to pick but because he's just paranoid. He's completely paranoid that someone's more popular than him. Whereas, what do you care? He's not competing against you. He's not raising an army. He's not having an. Uh, uh, or he's not ruling. Finally, the day comes. The new moon is sighted. And tomorrow we're going to see who comes, if he's going to go or not. Next morning, the news breaks. There's been a great death in the city. An invasion of the palace by a rival to the throne has Khusru Khan has killed Qutb al-Din and beheaded him as a rival to the throne. Okay. And he severed his head, kicked him out, and kicked out his whole team. So here you had the temporal king and the spiritual king. This had a fight and Whoever has this animosity to, to one of my awliya, I announce war upon him. And you're not winning that war. Okay, you're not winning that war. This rival group came in. Okay. Um, and before even the night came uh, of Maghrib of that first night, Khusru Khan seized the capital, seized the palace. And himself directly killed, all right, Qutb al Din. All right, killed him. All right, so that's sort of a climax that we're going to stop at. And next week we'll continue, finish with part three of Nizamuddin Awliya. And he does deserve three parts because he is considered really the, in the same way that we did in, in Al Maghrib, who was the, the patron sheikh, the, the beginning of all the Meshiach. And all of 
the the spirituality sort of the fountainhead where the source of all that you know for the middle ages of islam was abu madian and we did the whole talk on him well if in india it's nizam ad din and then in yemen we're going to study eventually al faqir muqaddim muhammad ibn ali ibn Arawi. we're taking like the, the the sources here right and so that is the story of nizam ad din awliya and inshallah we next week we finish it bi ta'ala okay and um, uh, yeah, with that, it should be that that'll be it for that. It's a beautiful story. It's an amazing. He's an amazing sheikh. He's a zed. His heart, his physically, he always there's always filled with dunya, because it was needed. But in himself, he was a complete uh, zed and all, and he did not care for power, and he did not compete. He did not compete. Period. He did not compete with the scholars. He did not compete with the Sufis. He did not compete with the... He was solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He did not compete for, uh, with the kings. He did not compete with the businessmen. And because of that, he was the right man right, to fulfill this mission, this divine mission of spreading this iman and this deen to people's hearts because he, he wants nothing from you. All right, we'll stop there and let's take questions specifically on this topic if we can. Uh, people here saying that they've actually visited the old uh, uh, or the the dirga of Nizamuddin in New Delhi. I wonder if there's a picture of it. Okay. And Maham says in Pakistan, his people, the Chishtiya, is still alive and well. Uh, Abby says, I don't think a fool would be appropriate because the prophet had Omar. No, we never said that. Uh, I don't know if she's referring to something that we said, but oops, I, I hate scrolling. I just X'd out of everything. No, we're just saying that that's a saying about scholars, not prophets. That some, uh, it's just a saying that some people, has, there's no analogy to prophets, of course. right? But it is a saying that um, you don't become. You're not fully. A sheikh has to have a, like a court jester, basically, to say what he doesn't feel like saying. Right. So, of course, it's not going to be an analogy to prophets. All right. What else we have? My question from Maham Masood. Awliya were always prepared for their death and their funeral arrangements. How do you suggest we do it? Do we take out an insurance plan that's roughly 10K? No, that would be haram for us to take life insurance. Life insurance is haram on two accounts. Number one, it's a riba we transaction. Riba is money for money. I pay you 10K, you're going to pay me X. Number two is gharar, bay al gharar. Bay al gharar is buying something unknown. That means, all right, I'm, Ahmed, I'm going to pay you $100, and however many apples come out this season, you give me them, whether it's no apples at all, or it's 100 apples, right? Uh, that's haram. So on top of that, what you're getting back is money. So it's a ribawi transaction, and it's bay al gharar So we're not allowed to take life insurance on both accounts. Okay, because the way insurance works is you take out a plan, you pay a certain amount every month, and that plan is, let's say, for, I don't know, however many hundreds of thousands or whatever they approve you for, and then you may pay something close to that, you may not, right, depending on how long you live. And so you don't know how much you're going to pay to get back this set of money. So either way, it's money for money, that's haram. And on top of that, it's gharar, because you don't know how much you're going to pay, you don't know how long you're going to live. So the way that which you're going to do this, if you want to prepare, is by saving. You save your money. Okay, save your money, and have that maybe in um, any type of. Uh, maybe you can eventually buy an apartment, and that money could be that apartment could be something that is inherited to your kids after that, so that it's an investment. Okay. Next question says, Muzammil Khan. 
throw, please throw some light. I think he means shed some light on the hadith uh, that anxieties are concerned and sins are forgiven with salah on the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, so very simply, the Prophet sallallahu said, whoever is fully busy with all of their extra ibadah, with salah on me, all of their anxieties will go away, their concerns will go away, and, and in another hadith, the sins are forgiven. With every salah on the Prophet said him, ten sins are forgiven and ten hasanats are put on your scale. So in in the um, in essence, nothing removes your anxieties better than salah on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Al Ba'alawi, the Habayb, who we're going to talk about inshallah one one of these days, Al Faqih Al Muqaddam Muhammad ibn Ali Ba'alawi, is that he is uh, their ibadah is of course ilm and Quran, but after that it's like 95% salah on the Prophet even when they put other adhkar they mix it with salah on the Prophet so if it's hasbunallah and amal wakil it's like a long dhikr mingling hasbunallah and amal wakil and salah on the Prophet other adhkar like that mingled with it salah on the Prophet Habib Omar authors these adhkar mingling Everything together and always having salah. Never you'll see him without a salah on the Prophet ﷺ in the middle of the dhikr. All right, this question says, um, this is part two. Yes, part one, you'll see it in the from last week's class. How do we reach the level of these zuhad? Very simply, is by loving the dhikr of Allah Ta'ala more than anything else. And someone asked me about the sweetness of dhikr. Are we allowed to seek it? Are we allowed to pay attention to it? And the answer, of course, is does not Allah say, Verily, by the dhikr of Allah, the hearts find tranquility. And, and so, is Allah telling us this as a footnote? Or is He telling us, O oh, you who want tranquility in your heart? Everything you want is to, to make something tranquil. If I, if I want a car, I'm in anxiety until I get that car, right? And I imagine that the car will fulfill my anxiety. Right? Like desire is a type of anxiety. I'm in an imagination that this thing is going to quiet my soul and make me at peace. And how many times, and I remember being young, I would say, hey, like people would have new shoes or new jeans. So, man, if, if just I can have those jeans, I'm going to be so happy. I'm, I'm done. I'm all happy. I'm all good. I'm going to be done for. If just I can have those skates, that jersey, if I could just have that, right? And I would get it. Okay. And I would always get what I wanted. Like 99% of the time I get what I wanted. Right? Two months later, two weeks later, it's old. It's on the floor. Right? Hanging it up doesn't have the, 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 the feeling anymore that it once had. Right? Until you start realizing a pattern. Nothing will. If the sneakers didn't fill your heart, except for like two days. Right? Right? And you know, I get these Jordans for the first time. Cannot believe I got Jordans, right? And you're like, you go up, you put them upstairs, you look at them, you show everyone, you come down for dinner. You go right up after dinner, oh, I want to go look at them. You go look at them again, right? You wear them, but you don't, you don't walk with them, right? <laughs> you, you, you don't want to crease them. You put them, you, you put them up. You put them on the bed, you put them, but eventually you're going to wear them. You wear them the first day, it's like you're the king. Second day, third day. On week two, thing is shot, right? And the first time that you scrape them on something, you're like so upset. You scrape them. What are you saying? This dunya, it's, it's fragile. This is a headache. I can't walk. I can't walk on the grass. I don't want to walk on the grass. I don't, I touch something. I'm ruining all my dunya, right? All my dunya is, it's so fragile. I'm actually annoyed by this. Even as adults, as adults, you get nice shoes for like a wedding or something. You can't even walk in these things. You ruin them. And then something falls on them or you step on something and they get leather, beautiful leather, scratched. Dunya is a headache to maintain. It's difficult to obtain, right? And then when you get it, it's a headache to maintain. You start putting a pattern together, right? And the pattern is, this is not going to be the source of of your long-term happiness. It is the source of a short-term happiness. 
and a short term, I'm in heaven for like 48 hours, for like maybe a week maximum, I'm in heaven, okay? It took a lot to get it, and it goes away quickly. So the cost and the benefits, it's just not worth it. Then you start realizing your, your, your brain has to catch up, and you start saying to yourself, there's got to be something better. And that's when you realize, hold on a second, the Quran is free, right? I can recite it any time. Nothing ruins it except sins. So I stay away from sins, right? But nothing ruins it in the sense that ibadah and dhikr and the sakina that comes from the heavens, it's never going to get old, right? And if, it, and if I lose it, I could just replenish. I gas up again with the Quran. And it's free. I could do it at all times. It's not like something where my thrill is like watching or playing sports. Okay, when the season's over, I'm in a depression, right? How many people, Ryan, did you play sports when you were young? Ahmed, did you? I don't know. For me, this was life. When the season is over, whether my season playing or the season watching it, literally the day of the season's over, it's depression. Nothing short of that. Like, why am I putting myself through this? You start making a connection. And that's what aql means. Aql is to connect from one thing to the next. I made a connection. I'm depressing myself by putting my hopes in something that, yeah, it does make you happy short term. And it leaves you empty at the end. We're not going to say it doesn't make you happy. It does make you happy. Otherwise, it wouldn't be worth anything. Like, nobody would be buying this stuff. It does make you happy, but it also makes you... And there is, there's got to be something to fill you up that's free, right? That I could do it at any time. And it's good for me, right? And it's going to last me until the akhirah, after death. So that's where, all right, you make that connection. And if you could work on that, you will naturally be a Zahid. And in the beginning, in the beginning, because you're, you, you're, you're, your past is an attachment to stuff, you have to break your past, right? So the, the, the murids and the zuhad, their beginning is extreme zuhud, like literal physical zuhud. I remember when I was like 17, I, ha- I had to sort of prove my zuhud to myself almost. So I had had this daisy, like a Libyan shirt and like rags, and I would just wear that, right? Because I could so easily go back to my old self that loved fashion, that loved clothes and that was very picky on clothes so I know because if you're an alcoholic right don't you have to go to an extreme away from alcohol because you could easily be sucked back in if you're uh, a guy of riba right you got to stay away from banks and businesses so far because you can easily be sucked back in so everyone who is a Zahid has to go far from what they are attracted to from where their sinfulness was they have to go far away from that. There are these like players before Islam or maybe they were in Jahiliya where he's clubs and women. When these guys make Tawbah, they got to go to like Mauritania. They got to go far away where there's no clubs and no women for them to chase. If you say, okay, just be a Zahid in your hometown and say, isn't the Hadith of the 99, he killed 99? What did the scholar say to him? The Zahid said, there's no Tawbah for you, so he killed him. That's 100 people he killed. What did the scholar say? He said, leave this town. You have to break the association of your past. So many Zuhad go to an extreme of Zuhud, right? And then once they've proven to themselves that they are so far from that lifestyle, they could come back. And oftentimes they do that old lifestyle, they do it well, but it doesn't affect them. Right? It has no effect on them anymore because he's completely broken his past. Okay? And that's the idea here that Imam al-Haddad said, whoever travels on the path of dhikrullah, the least and the first of his rewards is that the dhikrullah will be for him something sweeter than all of the dunya and what's inside of it. Right? Everything of dunya and what's in it will be less sweet for him. So the sweetness and the sakina that comes down becomes our honey. It becomes, we're like a bumblebee that, or, or we're like bears that seek that honey, right? And mala'ika are like that. Don't mala'ika, hadith of mala'ika says that there's a certain group of mala'ika. 
In the same way that we're made of matter and we feed off of matter. We eat matter, right? We're of the earth, we eat earth. We're of flesh, we eat flesh. We enjoy to eat flesh what we're made out of. What are malaika made out of? They're made out of nur. What's the sustenance of malaika? Nur. So when malaika see a gathering of dhikr, what is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ said? تُنَادِي الْمَلَائِكَةُ بَعْضُهَا بَعْضًا هَلُمَّ إِلَى حَاجَتِكُمْ O oh angels, there's a gathering of remembrance of Allah. Come, this is what you're looking for. In the same way, when we find a nice restaurant, a nice burger, this is, what you, this is the stuff, right? For our bodies. Malaika, when they see gatherings of dhikr, they flock to it because they're made of nur. The dhikr Allah bring down nur. This is what you guys want. Sit in this majlis. So the idea here that our dhikr Allah, the sakina of dhikr, becomes our food. The only thing that's correct is that we don't stop trying when we don't have the sakina. All right, that's the only thing. And the the idea of fi sabilillah is I'm doing something for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There may be a time I have to do something that would like negate my sakina. Like what, for example? Like you can you know sometimes studying does not bring you the same sakina as dhikr, but you have to study. Sometimes serving the community does not bring the same sakina, but you have to do it. It's better for you. It'll protect your, your ibadah later. Sometimes being with your family, it ruins my sakina. You have to do it. So I'm not an abd of sakina. I'm an abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the reward that I want from Allah, the least reward, is we want that sakina when we do remembrance. And that is ibadah. Because Allah is luring you. He's saying, By the remembrance of Allah, your heart will find tranquility. In other words, this is what you're looking for, O oh human being. And it's only in my remembrance. So, that's the concept and the idea that if you start to realize that that's where happiness is, and then you start to connect to other things too. Sakina is not just by tasbih. There's a special sakina for birr al There's a special sakina for serving the community. There's a special sakina for visiting the sick. All of these are different types. And if you're no longer tasting the sakina, something's wrong. Either your aqidah or sins. That's it. Simple. Either your ibadah is incorrect, your aqidah is incorrect, or you have some sins. And the, 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 the taste inside your heart, it becomes a thermometer. Right? If that if not going up, something's wrong. Right? If the if the if the mercury's not going up, if I'm not tasting, am I, if the food doesn't taste in your mouth, you must be sick. Something's wrong with you, right? So that's we use this as a as a gauge, right? We use, and and Sheikh Abdurrahman al Shahuri, he came to a young man who was doing dhikr, and the man was not like feeling anything, benefiting anything. He said, "Is there something wrong with your aqidah?" And he started questioning him on everything on aqidah. He found he has a hasad and a dislike for Ahlul Bayt. He's jealous of them. He said, "Get this out of your heart." He got out of his heart, and all of a sudden he was gone, right, uh, in terms of his benefit. All right. Next question. I want to take these on a, uh, quickly, so that we can get everyone's question in. All right, here we go. I gave, it seems like I gave myself away when I mentioned Jordans. Jordans came out when I was in second grade. and Or third grade, I think. Second or third grade. It was Junoon to get Jordans. Right? Junoon. I don't know what. it's. I think the Jumpman logo, it just, it's like people love it. The Jumpman logo. And the colors. Plus he won, too. Right? And it was Junoon to get logos, uh, Jordans. Some people got the Jordans. Some people got the knockoffs from Payless Shoes. The knockoffs, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then, and I would never, my mom wouldn't allow, she would pay $50, $60 for shoes that you're going to grow out of in one year. Because if you have, if you see kids, third grade, he might do two shoes. Fourth grade, he might go over two shoes. So I was never allowed to get them, right? Until finally, huh? I thought they were like hundreds of dollars. No, back in the day, they were 60 bucks. And that was insane num- amount for shoes, of money for shoes, $60. And then finally, when like I reached a certain age, then I got Jordans, right? But when you, when, you're, when you last two, three years with your shoe, 
But in third and fourth grade, you spend like, like one, week, one, one, one to two months on shoes and you got to get new ones. That's why we just get the kids Skechers. Skechers is made for parents. The company Skechers is made for parents. $15 shoes, right? With all the colors and everything. But it's a $15 shoe because you're going to get two, three of them a year, every academic year. All right. What's your opinion on Kowali? I don't really know. Kowali is what? Nasheed? That's all I know it is. Nasheed, right? Kyla White says, what if we know how much we are going to pay, like the same amount in and the same amount out? Then what's the point? Right? Kyla White is asking, if I'm going to pay the same amount in and get the same amount, then what's the point? Put it in your own piggy bank. Right? Is it true that Salawat, if it's said it once it equates to 100,000 times, once equates to 10 times, except on Jummah, equates to 100 Hasanat. Okay. I don't know about the Kowali. It's Nasheed to me. That's all I know what Kowali is, right? Isn't it Nasheed? Sharif, what's happening, man? How are you? What, do you have a half day today? No, I'm actually... Work from home? Yeah. Work from home. <laughs> <laughs> We have uh, Minna Zogby. I'm like, wait, aren't you in school? She's like, yeah, yeah I, I follow. I do take the live stream in, in <laughs> English class. Uh, can a woman visit a grave? Yes, a woman can visit graves. It's makru for the women to attend a burial. And Malik was a little more forgiving for women who are related to the deceased if they go to the burial. But the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ said women don't go to the burial, but the Prophet did not enforce it. If a woman came, he did not like expel her. So that's why the scholar said makru. It is makru for women to go to attend the burial. And it's but if they do, there's no uh, uh, they're not to be like expelled out of it. And there's it's more forgiveness or more leniency on the one who is related to the person. But we should follow the Prophet is better to follow his advice. Don't attend burials. It's gonna really like it could really mess your heart up. And Allah is always looking out for the heart of a woman. You have something to say, Ahmed? No, it's just, uh, me and Ryan, we went to a uh, Janazah. Yeah. And it was like, there was like, <clears throat> there was like, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So me and Ryan went to a Janazah and then uh, for a brother. And all the women, they were just wailing. Like, That's terrible. But the imam, the imam like stopped them and had them do like group tickets. Here's the thing. If that comes, then they put the imam in a hard situation. It was a tough situation. What do you he's yell at them for crying? He did that. He was like, "You're gonna, you're gonna get a, him bad deeds and everything," and then they also died. Uh, yeah, and because one of the meanings behind that is that the 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 deceased is upset that his women are crying, yeah. like he's upset by it. It's not like he's being tortured by it, but it is, it's an upsetness. When the prophet said they're tortured by your crying, it means he's upset by that. So that's why it's preferable for them not to see the visual. Even if, let's say, they're at the end of the, the, the graveyard, fine. After the, 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 the earth is covered, then they could come and they could spend time there. That's not a problem. Um... A woman is saying, I wear hijab, so I don't post my pictures that I don't without hijab anymore. This is Hanin. But my friend posts pictures of me without hijab. Your friend is not a good friend. You're not friends now. Yes. You, how are you gonna be friends? You have to tell her uh, that you know, stop posting my pictures up without hijab and someone needs to um, to get her to stop. Because she shouldn't do this. All right. So you can flag her, report her to Facebook. Uh, <laughs> report her to Facebook, posting pictures of me without hijab. Abby says, yeah, Tabaruj. Abby says, uh, might be a stupid question, but would plants' nur be different than malaika's nur? The plants, uh, they make tasbih. Plants make tasbih. And that's why it is something nice to have living plants around because they make tasbih. Nature. All of nature is good. Like when you see nature, you feel like, because these animals are innocent, 
right? The plants. Every tree makes tasbih. So that's why it's, it's a nice thing. Do you find plants in nightclubs? <laughs> right? <laughs> All you see is blue and purple lights flashing, flashing. Metal. Walls. No light. No plants. They don't like the light. Obviously, they, don't, they put walls so that you don't even know when the light is coming up, right? All these nightclubs, it's all darkness. And blue and pink lights flashing. No plants, no nur, no, nothing wholesome, right? Uh, Sada, is there anyone who has the level of Nizamuddin at the present time? I mean, Dar Mustafa to me when I went was the closest to any all of these what you see in these texts, and more even. Okay. Maham is saying no, no. I mean, a funeral arrangement plan, not life insurance. Poor sister, we accused her of trying to get riba, right? But no, she said funeral arrangement. Yeah, you should get. And I have a story about that one time when we first moved to London. There was an old British dude, right? Old British man. And he used to sell what's called like the evening, morning, I think it was like, there was a morning newspaper and an evening newspaper before cell phones, before smartphones. There were cell phones, but no smartphones. You pay him literally 50 cents, you get the morning paper, and you sit on the bus or the train. Every time this guy would see us, he would make fun of us for being Muslim, right? And he would say, Harry Krishna, Harry Krishna. He doesn't know anything, right? He's an old British dude. And we're like, it's just an old man. So we wouldn't say anything, right? Three years later, we, see, we had moved. We see the guy on a bus. I'm like, hey, this guy looks familiar. And then he looks at me and he's like, you guys look familiar, right? And then he strikes up a wonderful conversation. After a whole year of yelling at us, making fun of us, Harry Krishnas, Hindus, whatever, right? I'm sure you don't, um, he, said, he would say stuff like, Honestly, I thought it was hilarious. He'd say, I'm not going to offer you to buy this. I don't know if you guys speak English, right? He's an old British dude who the life has changed too quickly for him to keep up. And he's on the old racism of the 50s and 60s. I'm, I'm like, whatever, I don't care less. He's half drunk the half time anyway. We finally see him. This is the guy who harassed us every single day for a year. And we had moved. Now, two and a half years, two years, two, three years passed. We see the guy. I'm like, that guy looks familiar. And I'm like, oh, you're the guy from Archway, where we used to live. And he's like, yeah, I'm the old guy who used to sell the paper. I remember you. How are you? How's everything? As if, like, we're old friends, right? That's why I don't take seriously people's attacks and assaults that I don't take them that seriously when, they, when they're so superficial, right? He didn't even remember that he used to bother us for a year. So we're like, hey, where are you going? He said, hey, would you believe it? I'm going to The Undertaker's. The funeral home. He's like, I got kids, I got family, I don't want them arguing when I die, so I'm going to buy a tombstone, I'm going to buy a grave, and I'm going to f get my will ready to die. Right? And he was like happy, he was like, as if nothing happened. Right? So old people, you have to take them lightly when they, when they go crazy like that. And here's a guy who is basically um, uh, preparing for death. So yeah, so you got you to gotta prepare for death. You have to have a will. It's got to be with a lawyer who is a manager of your estate. You got to go buy a plot from a graveyard and you have to leave your, your final testament, which is your wasiya, right? Um, which is your advice to the people that, you're, that are going to live without you. On the topic of dua, Caitlin says, some people say we should thank Allah for accepting our dua even before we get the ijabah. You should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for even the chance of a dua. It's an honor for you to pray to Allah ta'ala. So yes, that's, that's what you need. Okay. What happens to animals after their death? If they were oppressed they're actually resurrected and justice is served and then they disappear they they're not given a eternal form uh fvrk says i will be in cairo where do you recommend me so so this person fvrk canertus send an email to info 
at safinasociety.org so that Ryan can connect you to Harun and Harun can tell you who to visit and which shiuch to sit around when you go to Cairo. Okay? So he says, I knew a guy, he used to say terrible things about the Messenger Sallallahu Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he actually died a few years ago with the same death that he used to insult the Messenger with. Wow, subhanAllah. Adawa to, to the MBA is going to be 10 times worse than Adawa to the Uliya. So it's not a smart idea. We should always make dua for our children especially. So there's an idea that we do something for everybody, but specifically for the for a set group. Our children need it a lot more. We have to always make dua for the youth. Plus, if the youth are good, then when we get older, he could be more relaxed. Right? Because these are the people who are going to be guiding your children. They're going to be influencing your grandchildren and raising the next generation. It's terrible for some of the elders of our ummah that they got older and the youth got worse. So they leave the world and the ummah is not in good hands. Aniqua says, is it that we can't will more than one third of the entire property? You're not allowed to, in your will, you're allowed to, to take one third of your wealth and uh, make it a bequest to a non-inheritor. A non-inheritor, meaning a, uh, a friend, an organization, a cousin, a, step, a, a, a stepchild. A foster child who lived with you, up to one third maximum. Okay. Shockwave. I noticed there's a trend. A lot of great sheikhs in history were persecuted. Yes, because they're the proof of Islam. They're the proof of Iman. And how do you how do you reveal their their true colors? Allah sends a tyrant or an oppressor to pull back the safety and security and show you show the world that they're going to remain firm that their roots are firm okay that's why Abu Hanifa he was jailed Malik was struck he was he was punished right and he was innocent Shafi was taken to court and accused of theft I, uh, sorry accused of rebellion in Yemen and he was taken all the way up to Baghdad Ahmed ibn Hanbal, of course, he's the most famous for how he was persecuted. Saibri says, what should our attitude be to the non-Muslims who visit Islamic graveyards as a place of spirituality and, and uh, uh, solace? We should say that's a proof then, right? You're a proof. You're benefiting from us, so maybe you should believe it. Because we do hold that the graveyards of the Muslims is a slice of paradise. It is. The graveyards of the Muslims is a piece of paradise. So it is a place of Sakina. Alright, next question here. Is there a difference between a male and female will? No, but the inheritance does. No, the inheritance does not differ. Except the husband versus wife. That's the only difference. Okay. That, that's the only... so. Spout, there's no category called spouse. You have to specify husband or wife. And the husband will inherit more than a wife. Why? Because he has dependents. Because the sharia obligates him to do more. The sharia will obligate a husband to spend that money in certain places. When the wife receives the money, she's not obligated to spend a penny of it. That's why same thing with sons and daughters. Sons will inherit double their daughters. Oh, that's oppressive. No, it's not oppressive. It's oppressive to your standard, which means nothing to us. It's fair because the Sharia obligates men to spend more money than women. A woman, a daughter who gets inheritance, she has to spend it on nothing. She doesn't have to pay her own rent, her own lights, her own food, her own clothes, her own security. If a son inherits, he will have to marry and he will have to spend on all of his wealth on, on his wife and his kids. And his mother if she has to. Or his sister if he has to. So that's why the Sharia uh, uh, gives him more. Because it obligates more. How do we re- manage to reach Zuhd while having a job? The Zuhd today is not by not having um, stuff. 
It's not by not having stuff. The zuhud today is that you don't love that stuff more than you love the remembrance of Allah. That this stuff will never sway you from your ibadah and your khidmah to the ummah. That's the real zuhud. And sometimes getting rid of stuff is merely a phase in that process. If you're too addicted to something, let's say you have an addiction to cars. Some people are like that. Some people have addiction to watches. They buy these ridiculous watches. Okay? Ridiculous watches. $25,000 watch. I mean, that's haram to me. Not makru. Haram. $25,000. Oh, it's an investment. There's a resale market for this stuff? Okay, I didn't know this. All right, maybe it is. So, um, if he becomes as he wants to separate his heart from that, it makes sense. At some point, he's going to need to separate his body from that. So he goes 10 years without buying a single watch. No watch at all, right? Until it's totally out of his system. I can understand that. So sometimes, to the thing that we're attached to, we need to cut completely. But we will never need to cut from everything, right? Saadi says, can you talk about Najmid Din Kubra? Inshallah, we can. Uh, can you do on a, uh, on a topic on Sayyid Muhammad Alawi Maliki? Yes. Uh, we can do that, inshallah. Someone asks, can you show us the steps of wudu? Glitter uh, Z, there is a um, YouTube. Go to Safina Saidi YouTube. Uh, and there is a full playlist on how to pray. And it has how to make wudu and how to pray. Can you do something on a woman from the awliya? Says Maham. Yes, we can, inshallah. We did Rabi al and there's, an, there's a, a book on this that has some of the contemporary and we'll, awliya from the women will do that, inshallah. Can I be Maliki in fiqh and maturidi in aqidah? Yes, nothing wrong with that. If the scholar's core is ilm, a normal person core is an onion, meaning he doesn't know stuff, you need a fool to deal with the common people. Uh, makes sense, Right? If when, when a scholar becomes so refined, he may not know how to talk to common people. Like, I like the scholars who know how to talk to the common people. It's fun to watch, right? There was recently a, a Syrian scholar who got bullied on Instagram. You all saw that? He's a Syrian scholar. You yes, yeah, a Wahhabi came up to him, a Salafi. He said, oh, you are Sheikh so-and-so. The Sheikh has taken a walk in Turkey. He said, you are a mubtada, you're a kafir. I worship Allah by believing that you're a kafir. My worship to Allah is to make takfir of you. And the sheikh just politely walked away. Right? And they said, look at the dignity of this sheikh. Dignity is nice. I also like toughness. I would, have no, I would have loved it to see the sheikh like, actually take the guy's phone, break it on his head, right? put him in a headlock. I would have loved it. Why not? Right? Why not? I would have loved to see that. I love to see a sheikh who also knows the ways of the streets. Right? Many shaykh are very dignified. They don't do that. They would never do that. Allah will send them someone to do that. Okay? But I would have loved to see something like that. Yes? Why not? Why not? Really? Yeah, of course. Why not? Oh, yeah. I thought like the the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam also he was always forgar- forbearing always forgiving but did not the prophet also tell us to take example from his companions right and were there many sahaba who defended themselves right and humbled the people in front of them so my attention i'm gonna do the ummah a favor because if i allow him to harass me isn't he gonna harass the next person too so i ought to teach him teach him a lesson right now remember what we don't have the the skin should not break and the bones should not break that's what i, I get everything up to that point right not gonna break your skin right or break your bones i would love to i'm not saying i could in all cases, you could be overpowered. But in some cases, it would be nice to see sometimes some of these people get a taste of their own medicine. Can you please talk about the Naqshbandi origins? All right, we, we could do all those, inshallah, bi All right. Jay Perez, I got knockoffs. They were shacks from Payless. Yeah. 
<laughs> Shaq messed up on his sneaker deal. It was terrible. No, Reebok. That, I think he did that purposely. Like he wanted to keep oh, he wanted for the for them skins. Yeah, yeah. That was he made a lot cool. more money with the Payless shoes than his deal with Adidas. Like he made like. Well, he was with Reebok, wasn't so he? Reebok, yeah. Yeah, Shaq was with Reebok. Shaq now is on everything. I'm surprised this microphone doesn't have a Shaq. Uh, uh, commercial to go to it. Everything, every every store you go to, every commercial, every store, every program you watch, you will see Shaq's face. It's he's whatever his agent is doing to make him commercials. You can go to Staples, you'll see Shaq stapling something, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, Subhanallah. Kawali says. It includes musical instruments. No, musical instruments should be avoided. The only debatable musical instrument that is today is debated, or in the old times was the flute, and today the synth is debated. But the string and everything? No. What about daughter attending father's funeral without wailing? She shouldn't be observing the burial. She should be at the back. Once the burial is over, then she could come after that. Uh, some of these uh, people, they know what bus Archway. Archway, yes, had bus 10, bus 73. Bus, I think it was 370 or something. There was a 300 number. But those buses, those old buses that you jump on, they sent them all to India. They're not allowed anymore. You're not allowed to jump on those old buses anymore. Like uh, you see in the movies, the British bus that the corner of the bus doesn't ha has just a pole, and you just hop on, and you hop off. But they don't allow those anymore. 390. I think I had the 390 and the 73. Reading a thousand salawat a day. Yes, this comes from Abdullah bin Masoud to do it every Friday, but the automat when they did it, they just started doing it every day. Every day a thousand salawat on the Prophet Sallallahu is a, something that you see in the works of many, many Zuhad and Obed. A, B, C, D, E, F, reading stories of the awliya, right, and hearing the narrations of them. We have to always talk about them because in the dhikr salahin tanzil ur rahma many people think it's a hadith, it's actually a saying of Hassan al-Basri. All right, we're going to wrap up soon. We got converts dinner tonight. Class, converts dinner, tasawwuf class. And then our gathering after Maghrib in the masjid. Hindus go to get ruqya done. We should... You got to try to teach them shahada. But the problem with them is that they're so fluid with reality. Right? They're so fluid with everything. Yeah, your God is true. And my God is true too. But how do two opposite things be true? But once you break that, the, the, the rule of non-contradiction, you don't have reality anymore. You're just swimming through life like based on your feelings. What is your truth? Oh, yeah, exactly. All right, folks. Unfortunately, uh, Muzam al Khan, he says, I didn't get an answer to my question. Let me go back to see real quick if I can find it. Muzam al Khan. Oh, I think I did. Yeah, I did answer it just now. All right, folks. Unfortunately, you got to run. Jazakumullah khairan. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Nashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk. Wal asr. Inna al-insana lafi khusr illa al-ladhina amanu wa aminu salihat. Wa tawasaw bil-haq. Wa tawasaw bil-sabr. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.